Jessica talks about Mongolia. As you may know, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Mongolia and I served as an English teacher in the countryside. With this video, I'll tell you a little bit about my time in Mongolia as a Peace Corps volunteer and the Lunar New Year. Mongolia is a large country found between Russia and China. It is totally landlocked, but it has beautiful geographies including lakes and rivers. In the south, you have the Gobi Desert, and in the north, you have forests as well as the large Lake Hovskol, which borders Russia. This is a map of Mongolia with its states or provinces. The word Imag means province. You can see that there are three districts within districts, and these are actually cities, but they have so many people relative to other IMAGs or provinces that they have their own administrative districts. In Peace Corps, I was sent to a small village in Selang IMAG to do my training with these five hooligans. This is the house where I lived with my host family. I had a mom, a dad, and a younger sister. Most of the village had dirt roads, which were terrible to navigate when it rained. We met nearly every day at this school to learn Mongolian, learn about Mongolian culture, and learn how to be a good English teacher. Thankfully, we also had time to go hiking, learn how to chop wood, and visit our host family's families in the countryside, where we learned how to make cheese, handle herd animals like cows, and also how to handle crying little Mongolian babies. Our group also organized a community trash pickup and installed new trash cans at the park. We also got to celebrate Nadam, which is a summer festival centering around three sports. We got to try different Mongolian drinks and wear Mongolian delts or dresses. Following our 10 weeks of training, we all went to Ulaanbaatar. Ulaanbaatar means Red Hero and is the capital of Mongolia. Though much of Mongolia is rural, Ulaanbaatar is a very developed city with all the modern amenities you would imagine in a global city. There is a central square called Sukhbaatar Square, surrounded by all these important buildings. But right in the front is the central government palace. The fin-shaped hotel is called Blue Sky and is one of the most iconic hotels in the city. There is a region called Zaisan, which is one of the more affluent parts of the city. Here you can almost forget that you're in Mongolia. However, if you look in the distance, you'll notice all the small houses or gears or tents that Mongolian people live in. Since they're not connected to any central heat, they have to burn coal or wood, which causes some serious pollution in the wintertime. For about the next two years, I went to live in Overhanga Aimeg, in a small little village of about 2,000 people. Many people lived out in the countryside in the Mongolian tent or gear. Our region was pretty mountainous and had one large river there, as well as temporary rivers from snowmelt. There was one school and it was maintained by staff and faculty of about 30 people. My province of Overhangai had a capital called Arvahir. Its city square was named after this one soldier named Ayush. While my village had about 2,000 people, this provincial capital had about 30,000 people, in comparison to Ulaanbaatar, which has 1.5 million people. Provincial capitals have plenty of hotels, bars, and restaurants. In Mongolia, Korean restaurants are pretty popular. Most provincial capitals have children's parks where there are ferris wheels and rides, and on Children's Day, these parks are free and open to the public. Like in Ulaanbaatar, most provincial capitals struggle with pollution in the wintertime. This provincial capital over here is actually going through a growth spurt. What you see here is a new swimming pool that was built in the last year, and right across is the wrestling stadium, which is a pretty popular sport. The province capital's name comes from a special horse. I don't know the story exactly, but a mile or two away from the capital city, there is this nice monument to horses and the horse over here. Now I'd like to tell you about the Mongolian Lunar New Year, also called Sakansar, or White Month. It is similar to the Chinese Lunar New Year in terms of the timing and some events, but there are some big differences. The biggest similarity between the Mongolian and Chinese Lunar New Year is that they follow the lunar calendar, meaning that New Year changes from year to year. In the Chinese Lunar New Year, they put a lot of importance on the color red. However, in the Mongolian Lunar New Year, there is no particular color, However, they do have five colors that are special to Mongolian culture. They are blue, yellow, white, red, and green. They are related to the older religion of shamanism and Buddhism in Mongolia. In China, families come together on New Year's Eve, and as you can see, they eat food and they use chopsticks. 
However, in Mongolia, while families do come together on New Year's Eve, the food is different. As you can see, they have a whole lamb and a special cake on the far end. Most families have three layers of that cake material, while elders have five. In China, people usually stay up until midnight to celebrate the new year and they set off fireworks. However, in Mongolia, instead of staying up really late, they get up really early. And particularly the men, they go climb mountains and they welcome the sun. In China, they give out red envelopes with money in it to families and friends and even acquaintances. In Mongolia, they don't give out red envelopes with cash in it. Instead, whoever comes to their home, they give some sort of gift. Now I'd like to introduce you to my friend Sebastian. He was a Peace Corps volunteer leader, and he spent three years in Mongolia, and one year he was helping out the new people like me. He made a really great video of his time in the countryside celebrating his second Mongolian New Year. He currently is a teacher in Japan teaching English. It's 6.30, the sun rises at 7.30, and we're going to greet the sun with all of the community members. The Mongolian traditional clothes is called a del, which is similar to a dress. They have different ones for the winter and the summer. Men wear belts around their hips, while women wear belts around their waist. Morning, Lauga! Instead of folks going to the peak of a mountain, we see people here congregating at a religious structure, which is important in Buddhist and shamanist religions. at Lauga's house and we're gonna celebrate Sagan Sar here together. Here Lauga is offering milk to the sky, which is a shamanist tradition. You have some way. Chocolate more. Walking to people's houses. Happy Sagansar. Shall I beg you? Ah, Sano. Sahan Sinich Bano. Over the three main days of Sagansar, Mongolians typically visit between six and a dozen different families each day. It's a way to show respect to your friends and family and to bring the community closer together. This is where the edge of town meets the countryside. In that direction, there's nothing for four hours. That's Sagan Sar number two in the books. Here I'm helping my boss and neighbor make literally hundreds of boats or Mongolian dumplings. On Lunar New Year's Eve, families gather and eat as much as they can. The belief is, is that it's good luck to start the new year with a full belly. And here is a central cake and is topped with a variety of cheeses, butters, and curd. Many families are Buddhist, and for each house that you visit on Sagansar, you should find a shrine, bow, and turn the prayer wheel. The outfit for men and women is essentially the same, except for the placement of the belt and the option of wearing jewelry. All Mongolian houses will have the central table, with the lamb, the cake, and a multitude of sweets and drinks. The man in gold was the school's gym teacher. As the oldest man, he cut off a piece of meat and gave it to each person in the room. 
Here's a picture of a young boy being taught how to exchange those snuff bottles, which is typically a practice for men. Grandchildren visit their grandparents on Sagansar and must endure the obligatory kisses slash sniffs on the cheeks. In Mongolian culture, people sniff cheeks as a sign of endearment. The main point of Sagansar or Lunar New Year in Mongolia or even China is to be back with the family. Millions of people travel hundreds of miles to go back to their home village, spend time with their loved ones. And of course, you have to take some pictures for Facebook and Instagram. I hope you enjoy hearing about my Peace Corps experience and a little bit about Mongolia. Dara utsi neduta. See you later, my friends. The Star Wars character Padme is seen wearing this elaborate headdress, which is styled after a particular Mongolian tribe's headdress. The shape of the hair and the jewelry are meant to resemble a bull's horns. While the Western world knows him as Genghis Khan, Mongolians actually call him Chikis Khan. I guess some explorers weren't listening very carefully. Some people confuse Mongolia with Inner Mongolia. Inner Mongolia is a province in China, while Mongolia is its own country. Many Chinese citizens living in Inner Mongolia are Mongolian ethnically. Horses in Mongolia are a little bit smaller than the horses we see in the United States or Europe. Also, Mongolia is home of the last wild horse. This breed has supposedly been here since the time of Genghis Khan. This is a picture of Mongolian traditional script. Due to Russian influences, Mongolians use Cyrillic script in their day-to-day -day life. However, there is a movement to teach the script to students and to bring the script back. Many dinosaur fossils have been found in Mongolia, especially in the Gobi Desert. There are also a handful of museums scattered across the country. For a long time, Mongolia was under a one-party communist rule. However, due to a democratic movement, Mongolia was able to peacefully transition to a democracy in 1990.